Dr. Benson, it's a delight and an honor to be here with you in your institute. I've wanted to have this conversation for a very long time. I read your book in the early 70s when it first came out. I was in San Diego and I still have one of the original editions, I think the original edition. So uh, I, we're going to spend three days in the institute to discuss about the future of mind-body medicine with different people, uh, Manoj being one of them. And we just had a very nice conversation with the director, Greg, uh, uh, and we'll have a few more. So uh, uh, you need no introduction. You're one of the most famous persons in the, in the field of uh, mind sciences. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to uh, understand your views on where do you think is the cutting edge of this field? It's come a long way. Uh, you've played a major role. What are some of the major milestones or breakthroughs you feel might happen in the next several years? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm honored to be interviewed today. And I want to pay my respect to the Indian culture because in India, over 4,000 years ago, many techniques evolved that I studied just 40 or 50 years ago. These include meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong. They all have been used to counteract the harmful effects of stress. We, I believe, have done very little because what we have done is put a scientific basis on what has been going on for all of these millennia. Now, stress has certain components that can be measured physiologically, biochemically, molecularly, and stress is so important because it influences over 60% of visits to doctors. And we do not have drugs, we do not have surgeries that work effectively. What we have seen is that when people carry out two basic steps, one is the repetition of a word, a sound, a prayer or phrase. And the second is when other thoughts come to your mind, you passively let them go and come back to the repetition. What that does is break the train of everyday thinking and allow the body to revert to its innate resources that are not affected by stress. Mm. Now, this is important because the ubiquity of stress and what these ancient cultures have shown us with these two steps, you can change and treat medicine along with, treat medically, along with drugs and surgeries. That's what I see the ultimate future. But what's so important is that stress is so widespread that we can actually learn more about the basis of stress, and that's where the complexity of the brain plays a vital part. And here, to have the technical abilities to look at these multitudinal factors causing disease will be important. Mm. So there has to be a marriage, a marriage between science, mind-body work, which includes religion, of course, because people often use a prayer as the repetition, and modern science. And I see wholesale healing occurring, which wouldn't be present in the past. And this type of 
ubiquitous healing can help people. We're not going to do away with death. <laughs> right. But what we can do away with is any disorder that's caused or made worse by stress and leave healthier lives before we pass away. Mm. So is there a epigenetic response or consequence of prolonged meditation? I mean, do you see, besides short-term stress reduction, is there any long-term physiological shift? As we have studied these techniques that evoke the relaxation response, we are now looking at the changes genomically. Okay. And the genomic changes seem focused on uh, the inflammatory system mm. because inflammation with the immune system operating seems to affect so many disorders. This includes mental th disorders, anxiety. It includes high blood pressure. It includes injury to nerves. It includes often cancer itself. Now, can we cure these? I don't know, because we do have to pass away from something. But what it will cure is that it could cure the aspects of the disease that are stress-related, and genomics or one of those areas. Hmm. So uh, later when we discuss, I want to get into the genomics also to see what is the, what is the imprint or what is the response uh, of these practices, what happens to the genome. Uh, you know, that, that I think must be very fascinating. So uh, do you feel that uh, the future uh, of mainstream medicine includes a large component of this? Oh, I think it's a major component because drugs and surgeries can go that f so far. So why uh, have insurance companies not covered this when there is uh, scientific evidence? That has been a perplexing thought for me for years mm. because after all, insurance companies would save money. Right. But perhaps the pharmaceutical industry yes. has such influence yes. that it could even influence a, a cure by saying it's non-pharmacological. Right. That's what I thought. That's what I, my feeling is that the, uh, a drug-free treatment and a preventive treatment will not be good for the economics of the pharmaceutical industry. That may be a major feature, you're correct. Yes, yes, yes. But you would think that uh, the insurance companies should know better for their own sake. Uh, One would hope so. So is the intervention the through education? Do you think that the future lies in re-educating doctors, uh, I introducing this in medical colleges? Education is a critical factor. In other words, students, all students, not just medical students, should learn about this scientifically proven age-old capacity they have within themselves. And then it should become a feature, of course, in medical school. Now, has research been done on comparing the effect of different approaches to meditation. For instance, for instance, the introducing a word is one approach, but in mindfulness meditation, the Vipassana meditation, John Kabat-Zinn's meditation, they don't introduce a word, they just observe, the witness what already is. So, so one is, in adding a content to eliminate the chattering mind, and the other is just witnessing 
to silence the mind. Mindfulness meditation is but one technique. Right. There are other forms of meditation. Right. In the West, mind has not been considered to be important. Mm. That's why the scientific method really evolving from the time of Pasteur, Koch, um, uh, Fleming with penicillin has focused on provable scientific um, approaches. What we have now and what our work has done has shown that the mind can be, the effects of the mind can be studied. Right. And that's what we're talking about now. Right, right. And the two can come together, and that's where computer science is so important. Right. So in the case of giving somebody a medicine, you can compare the effect of medicine A versus medicine B versus placebo and dosage one versus dosage two. Are there such studies in meditation saying we'll do longitudinal study with, with word, mantra, compared to mindfulness, compared to yoga nidra, which is lucid dreaming, Compared to yoga. Compared to yoga. Yes. Are there comparative studies longitudinally? Because maybe some of them are good for one, one disease, some are good for another disease, it could be. Think of medicine and health and well-being as akin to a three-legged stool. Okay. Well-being is the stool. We can influence it by drugs. We right. can influence it by surgery. Right. We can influence it now by mind-body age-old techniques. Right. Where computer science will come in is how we integrate them right. for, the better, for better health and well-being, the three-legged stool. And this institute is doing a lot of good work in um, empirically validating, empirically testing, uh, proving for the scientific uh, you know, people who are skeptical, proving for them uh, so that more and more of this can be part of uh, mainstream medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Herb Benson with me, the founder of this institute and uh, a pioneer in the empirical testing of age-old meditation techniques. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here and also hit the bell icon to make sure you get notified. To donate, please click this button.